Now, we all know iterators. Uh, they've been around since the C++ stone age, C++ 98 or something. Um, they are certainly modeled after pointers. People looked at the way we iterate over arrays, and, and we use a pointer as pointing at, at one element at a time, and we increment and we can decrement, and there's a beginning of the array, and the end of the array is one past the end, and that's kind of the idea that we took and then said, okay, we're gonna do iterators just like that. Um, now, in C++, iterators can really be two different things. They can be elements. So if you have a vector of um, numbers, of integers, uh, you can find the minimum element in that vector. It returns you an iterator. And the meaning of that iterator is clearly an element. It's, it's one of the elements in the, in the vector. That's the minimum element. Now, there is also the other usage, which is when you're talking about borders in, in a vector. So you have a vector that's 0, 0, 1, 1. You run the upper bound of 0. So that's the upper bound of the range of zeros in that vector. And that, some, that's, that place is really between the zeros and the ones. And the way we express that with an iterator is we go one past that border and point at that element. But the semantics is really the border between the zero and the one. And that's a distinct difference in semantics for, for elements and for borders. Now, in, since C++20, we have ranges. And ranges are really anything that has iterators and that you can iterate over. Now, this comprises containers, uh, vectors, lists, sets. They, as we all know, they own their elements. They have deep copying. So when you copy them, they copy all their elements in O of n. And uh, they have deep constants. So when the, element, the container is const, you cannot mutate any of the elements. There are also views. And views are different. Um, they usually reference the elements. They, are, they have shallow copy. So you can copy it in O of 1. They're kind of thinking about like weakening that a little bit so you can move in O of 1. Um, and you have shallow constants. So if, you, if your object is a view and it's const, that doesn't mean you, can mute, you cannot mutate the elements in that view. Now, we all know views conceptually already. Views are what we always passed as iterator pairs into all kinds of algorithms. And, and that was really had exactly the semantics of what is now a view. So the idea was simply, why pass two things into the algorithm? Why not just bundle them together and pass them as one object? And that's now a view. And uh, they actually, the standard has this subrange, which is really just, just that. It's, 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 it's a pair of iterators wrapped into one object. Now, what does that allow you to do? Uh, if you write something like this with iterators, you have, say, a vector, you sort it, and now you want to erase duplicate elements. And as you can see, you have the writes that sort, vector begin, end, and erase, and yes, again, again, begin and end and end. So you have to write a lot of begin and end uh, to pass that information into the functions. And uh, with ranges, you can write that a whole lot more compactly. Um, now you have ranges sort, and uh, then you do ranges unique, and that returns you the range of things that are, that are kind of to be erased, and you take, take the begin of that and you go to the end of your vector, and that's what you have to erase. Now, um, in that code, in that with ranges code, there is a bug or a pitfall, and I wonder if anyone can see it. The end. So, so, the end. No, they're actually the same kind of iterators. You asked whether it's a different kind of iterators. No, it's the same kind of iterator. Uh, the end pointer is also still valid. Um, that, that's fine. It's something in the, in the algorithms. What does range unique do? It's a view, right? Yeah, range unique returns a view. It returns like a, like a, like a, 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 a sub view on that, on the, on the, on the last, iter on the last elements that you can actually, um, that, that you're supposed to erase, that are to be erased. Now, what kind of operator does ranges unique use? to remove elements, the equal operator, right? So what does sort use? Well, it uses the less operator. And that's the problem here, because if you have an element uh, or you have, you have, you have a, a, a type where these two things don't agree, and maybe it's not very smart to write these kind of types, but 
it's possible, then this code would be buggy, right? So uh, in our library, there is a sort unique in place, which actually reuses the predicate that you use for sorting to remove the unique elements. So you really have to tie these two together to get correct code. OK, um, to make things more interesting, there are more, well, more interesting kinds of views. And these are adapters. Um, so here's the problem. You have a vector of ints, and you run range find on it to find the first zero. And OK, so far so good. You get an iterator to the zero. Now let's say you have a vector of pairs, and uh, you want to find, again, that, that the pair consists of, of integers and, and a character, something else, and you still want to find the first zero. And the way you would write this um, without using any other tool would be with a find if, where in the predicate you access the first and you compare against zero. The problem is, in my eyes, this is related in semantics. We both, in both cases, want kind of do the same thing. We want to find zeros. But it's not related at all in syntax. It, it doesn't, look, doesn't look similar. In one case, you use find. In the other, you use find if. And, and the problem really is that there are two operations going on, which we lump together. One is the projection, and the other one is the search. So there is the projection, which is the access a first, a dot first. And then there is the, the zero that we want, want to find. And, and we also replicated actually the equal operator, which is, which is implicit in the range find. So how can we do this better? Enter the transform operator, uh, transform adapter. Um, so you have, still have the vector of pairs, and uh, you'll, you'll find if. And uh, we now want, using the transform adapter, we want to separate, we will separate the projection and the search criterion. So first of all, we take the vector, and we transform it by applying a projection. We, we pipe the, in, in, into the views transform, um, which projects the values of the, the, the pairs onto the number. And that's done lazily. So it's just forming an object, which is referencing that vector. And now we can, on that, on that, on that object that is now conceptually a, a, a range of, of integers, we can just run the ranges find as we did before and find the zero we get an iterator back. Now, um, as I said, vector is not modified and, and it's all lazy, so it's, it's very cheap. The, the first producing this trans object is, is, is very cheap. Um, you, you don't pay for anything unless you actually start iterating. And we don't have to iterate very far because the, the zero is the first element. OK, so we get an iterator back. Um, now let's say we want to do something like this. We, we want to access the, the element, the second, that's associated with the zero that we are looking for. So we want to look for the zero and then map, basically find the, 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 the car that this zero maps to. And if you write this the old-fashioned way with a find if, you'll do it like that. You would just simply get the iterator back, and you would just call second on it. Um, how do you do this when you use the views transform? Now, the ranges find gives you iterators to ints. So just to do second on it won't work. There is no second on this, on this iterator. You can just dereference it, and you get an integer back. So what we need to do is we need to peel off this transform. So we added a transform, and the iterator is now somehow knowing this transform. And we want to do is we want to go from the iterator to the transform to the iterator to the base to the base element. And there is a function that does it, which is dot base in the standard library. And uh, then things work. So you call ranges find on trans zero and then dot base, and that goes back to the base cloud, base iterator. And then you can call second because that iterator is again pointing to the pairs. Now, you can see here at the bottom uh, what is essentially happening. Before, we had an iterator on the value, on the zero. And we call it, when we call dot base, we have to go to that, to the, to, 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 we have to turn it into an iterator to the pairs. Now, find returns an element, right? It does not return a border. It's the, the element that has that property that you're looking for. And the base should better preserve the identity of that element that's important. So when the, the zero came from some sort of element, that from some pair, we produced that zero by using the projection, 
Then we said, okay, we want that zero. And now we have to go back to the corresponding element. And it seems like quite natural. Yes, of course, that's, that's what this dot base has to do. Okay. Now, as I said, there are also iterators with the role of a border. Now, how does it look like there? Say we have still have the same trans, we have the same projection, and we run an upper bound, which returns us an iterator to a border. And we call, call base. Now, what's important here is, is not that the, the element is preserved. It's important that the border is preserved, because the border is the semantics that we are after. So they, they are, there's essentially a border described by, by, by the return of the upper bound, which is between the zero and the one. And we then call base, we better get an iterator that describes that same border in the original sequence. And that's actually what's happening. So of course, the iterator doesn't know whether it's meaning as a border or an element. But in this case, it all just works fine. It is pointing to the first element that has one, which has the semantics of the border before, which is between zero and one. So far, so good. Let's look at the filter adapter. Um, the filter adapter and, and transform and filter are really the, the two really important adapters. Um, they are just, it's just leaving out some elements of a sequence. You just pass it in a filter criterion and whatever passes that filter is left in the sequence. So you have a filter um, where the vector gets, gets piped into the filter and it in this case takes out or preserves everything where that character in the pair is a B. So only the, the second and the fourth element. Now we do the same game. We transform, look for the first, or try to project onto the first, and do find with zero. In this case, uh, we have actually two things to peel off. We have to peel off the filter, uh, or the first the transform, and then we have to peel off the filter. So here's again the little drawing. So we point at the zero. Now the dot base goes to the zero B, because that was what we had before the filter, before the transforming. And then we, we peel off the filter and we, we are pointing then at the zero B in the very base sequence, which happens to be the second element. Now it's interesting to note that this is not the same result that you would get if you had run the same searching on that original sequence. But that's not important here. What is important is that you preserve the semantics of the element. You have, you have the filter, the filter gets you, in, and the find gets you a particular element in that filtered sequence, and we want to find the original uh, element in, 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 the, um, in the unfiltered sequence. And, and that's what dot base happens to do. So I think it's all fine, all good. Okay, let's uh, keep going. And maybe you kind of see where this is going. Uh, let's do this with the upper bound, okay? So in this case, you were looking for the upper bound of the zero. And we have a zero, um, and we have in, that, in that sequence, that filtered sequence, we only have a zero and one. It's, it's filtered and, trans and, and transformed, projected. You have a zero and one, and, and that boundary is in the middle between the zero and ones. So that's what we want to find with the upper bound. Okay, so far so good. So we again unpeel the transform um, with the first dot base, and then we unpeel the filter. And then we end up with, well, a border that is before the one B and after the one A. Now, is that the right one? Well, it's ambiguous, right? Because we are really having a border here between the zero and the one in the, in the filtered sequence, and there is no corresponding border in the original sequence. There's not just one, there's two, because one of the elements kind of disappeared into our filter. So if we, if we cut the, the filtered sequence, there is no equivalent cut in the original sequence that we could take. So this is ambiguous. We shouldn't really be doing this. This is, this is semantically not sound. Now, okay, maybe the answer is then don't do it, right? Okay, could say, well, that, that, that solves it. Well, let's see. Uh, there's another adapter, which is the reverse adapter. Now, the reverse adapter, we play the same thing, right? We again have our sequence of uh, pairs, and we pipe it through the reverse adapter. And that turns around the order of the sequence, as the name suggests. Now, again, we do our transform and we do it again our find. And now we have uh, an element, right, which is um, 
now it's it's the, the reverse sequence. So you're you're pointing at the first zero there. Then you peel off your your transform. Then you have to point at the zero B because that's where this thing came from. And then you call again base, and that has to point at zero B in the original sequence because in find we wanted to find the identity of some element, and and you better get that element in the original sequence when you call dot base. Okay, so far so good. Now let's do this with lower bound. So with lower bound, um, in this case with greater, you find a, a, a border between the, the ones and the zeros, right? And that border is, is, yeah, between the one and the zero. And then you peel off again the transform, which is again between one and the zero. And now you call base again. And it will still give you well, base doesn't know what you want. It doesn't know whether it's an, an element or a border. It's just an iterator. So you call dot base on the iterator, and you would again get the same answer, 0b, and that's just the wrong answer. That's not what we want. If we go to the 0b, what we for in the original sequence, the border is then between the 0a and the 0b, and that's just the wrong place. That's not the border we found when we originally called lower bound. We found the border between the zero and the one, the zero B and the one A. So in, on one hand, if to preserve the identity of the border, the base has to give you back the, when you, when you unpeel the reverse, has to give you back the third element. When you call base and it's the role of the element, it has to give you back the second element. And there's just no way for it to know what you want. There's just no way to say what you want. And that's a problem, I think. Now, why is that so in case of the reverse, it, uh, reverse adapter? Let's take a look briefly how the reverse adapter works. It stores the base iterator. So the iterator of the base adapter stores the base iterator. And when you increment that iterator, it's decrementing the underlying base iterator. Sure enough. When you Decrement the, 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 the reverse iterator is to increment the underlying iterator. So far, no surprise. Now, the operator dereference is a little bit surprising, possibly, because it has to decrement the iterator before it returns the value. And that's the case because the iterator at begin, so, so first of all, we know, that, we know that in that original sequence, there are only so many iterators we have available. There is only for begin to end, which is exactly one more than there is elements in the sequence. Uh, that's, that's how iterators are built. So if you want to assign that to the reverse sequence, we basically have no other choice but to say, OK, for the begin iterator of the reverse, we store the end iterator of the base. And for the end, we store the begin iterator. Otherwise, we just didn't, don't have enough iterators to play with. So, and when you, when you um, store the begin, and you, 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 if you, for the begin, you store the end, you have to be able to dereference begin. So, and the last element is, end, is at end minus one. So when you dereference, that begin is the underlying is end, but you have to dereference end minus one, so you have to subtract one. Now, for the, the, the base begin, where you store the end instead, um, you actually don't have, so for the, for, the, for, the, for the end where you store the begin of the base, you don't have the problem that you will decrement the base because end is not dereferenceable. So everything is fine, except that, well, um, our, our base doesn't work. So, um, yes, so the element after the border in the reverse sequence, sequence is the element before the border in the original sequence. That's why it doesn't work. Now, before I go into possibly how to solve it, um, I want to see, I, I just gave you examples, right? And I want to look at, okay, where does that problem appear in general? What's, what's the scope of that problem? How big is it really? Um, well, if you think about an adapter that changes the order of elements, say you have an adapter that's, that's a sort adapter. Um, there it's pretty clear that if you shuffle all these elements around, in the adapter, then any information about the border is completely meaningless in, when, you, when you call base because they've been shuffled around. The, the elements, though, are still, are still available in the original sequence, so you can just expect that base will point at that same element 
in the base sequence. So that so that so element is well defined. You can you should be able to call base for elements, but base for borders is kind of meaningless. And in, in, in the best of all worlds, it probably wouldn't compile. Now, the reverse adapter is a special case of that uh, because everything changes sides. So in this case, uh, the base of the border is, is well defined, but it's different from the base of the element. But that, that's a special case. Now, there may be adapters that remove elements, for example, the filter. There, the elements may be filtered out. So some elements may collapse into the border. And when you, when you do the base and, and try to get to the, to, the, to the base of the border, um, that's in general ambiguous. The base of the elements is well defined because all the elements of your, of your transformed sequence or your filtered sequence are in the original sequence. And that is true for filter, for sorted intersection, sorted difference. Now, there may also be adapters that add elements. Um, and for example, sorted union. So when you are mixing other elements into your, into your iterator, into your range, elements of other ranges. So in this case, the base of the border is well defined because you are only adding elements. So when you're right, the, the border will always fall somewhere in between the elements of the original sequence. But the base of the element is undefined because you've may picked an element that's just not in the, in the, base, in the base range. So in one case, we have the border is well defined and the element is not. In the other, ways it's, in the other case, it's exactly the other way around. Okay. Now, what do we do? Okay, so at least we should separate the functions. Uh, base is just not a good name. It's just not a good, good thing. It's, um, we need to distinguish between the base for the borders and the base for the elements. It's a small change, but there is no safety against making the wrong choice. The bigger change would be, and I would advocate for that, that we kind of say bye-bye to iterators, at least in our mind. We should think about borders and elements. And then base, if these two have two distinct types, could always do the right thing. Now, the question, of course, is, OK, that, that's a bold claim. You get rid of all the iterators. That would conceptually change a lot of code. That kind of assumes that in the code, these, these iterators have already distinct roles where you can say, OK, if I'm looking at this iterator, I can say, you are a border or you are an element. And the, the, the question is, can you do that? Can, is, is that? is that distinction possible in a normal, regular code base? So what do we do? We actually check this hypothesis against our one million lines of code that we have a think so. And here's what we found out. Now. We looked at returns of find um, and, and looked at how it's being used. Now, find produces, we, we, we actually, and you'll see that later, we annotate these calls to find. And 201 of them actually produced this unique matches. We were looking really not for the first element, but for the only element in that sequence with that particular property. And only one of them was used as a border. So that was kind of like a, a trim. It kind of trimmed away the beginning of the sequence. And we were really interested in, in something that, that started somewhere. Now, one actually got incremented because we wanted to find the border after this element. That's, that's why we incremented the iterator. But the semantics were we want the border afterwards. And all the others were actually finding elements. We actually used the reference, the iterator afterwards. We really wanted to find the element. We also have 98, which are only first matches where there may be duplicates in the sequence. Uh, again, seven had the border role. Five incremented to get the border after the element. So seven before, five after. Everyone else was just element. And it got dereferenced. And in, it being dereferenced is a clear indication that you want the element. Actually, you are after the value. Now, um, find if, similar story. So we got 67 single matches. They're all elements, 75 first matches, three are borders, everyone else elements. Lower bound, that's actually quite interesting. Um, two of them used the, didn't use the predicate again that was passed to the lower bound. Well, 89 of them used the predicate again after the lower bound to find out whether we got a single match. And these are really binary searches. 
right? So you do a lower bound, you again then check the predicate. Is that really in there or is it not? And, and that's, that's what this, this function did um, in this case. And clearly, it was actually looking for an element. It was not looking for a border. Then 19 of them used the predicate to find the first match. Um, and they also looked for, for elements. They also dereferenced afterwards. Upper bound. Um, well, actually, um, so 17 were after the border. And 7 got actually decremented because we wanted to, the element of the end of the sequence, of the, of, the, of the equal sequence, lower bound, upper bound. We wanted the, the last element that was, um, that was matching. So result is we can actually assign distinct roles for, for borders and elements. We know when we look at code, is that a border or is that an element? We, we were able to make that distinction. And let's face it, iterators were always ugly because you can dereference begin, you cannot dereference end, and it's all very, it's not symmetric, it's not nice. It, everyone look, learning C++ looked at that skewed picture of iterators and was like, ah, why, why is that end like hanging off there and the begin isn't and why is it this way and not the other way around? And, and it's like, ah, it's, it's good darn ugly, right? If we turn, go into to elements and borders, everything is nice and symmetric. You have a beginning at the very beginning and the end at the very end, and in between you have borders and the elements in between the borders. So, it's all good, right? Looks much prettier. Now, the other thing that I, I, I dislike about the iterators um, is, is this end, right? So when you're doing this find, uh, then it returns end as, well, as, as meaning it, I didn't find anything. There's nothing there. And so, so when you, sometimes when you, when you use it as a border, it's clear that it's the end of everything. But if you're really looking at for an element, what you really want to say is there is no element. I'm, I'm, I, I didn't find anything. Sorry. And, and now for in the existing standard, you always have to compare against end. I was like, well, why? Um, and, and it's ugly because you have to mention the range twice. So we wrote this range, so you have to assign a variable to the range um, in order in order to to be able to, to mention it twice. You first, you need it for your end check again. So you cannot write it in line. Why can't we write this, right? So you, you do, um, you, you assign the iterator and then you, you kind of check, do the Boolean check on the iterator, kind of like a null pointer, right? So the null pointer says, there's a null pointer, it says, uh, there's nothing here. Um, and if there is a pointer, then there's a pointer. So why can't I write this? I want to write this. So, how do we have to make that these concepts, border and element, in order for this to work? So the border is like an iterator, but we shouldn't dereference it because it's a border. There's nothing there. And if we are not at the beginning, we can have an element before function that gives you the element before that iterator and an element after which gives you the element after the iterator. And the element after, in, in the case, if, it's, if that's all still implemented as iterators, which in practice it would be, element after is more or less a no op, um, and element before has to decrement. Now, clear range begin and end should be borders. We are describing the, the, the limits of a, of a range. Um, and all these iterator pairs that go into algorithm, they are all borders. They are all describing the, the beginning and end of some sort of input range. Um, so these are all borders. Now the output iterators are also borders because they are describing the end of your, of your, of your sequence that you're writing to. You, that's, the, that's the thing that you are extending every time when you, when you add an element. Now the iterators that are returned, that depends on the algorithm. So the return iterators are sometimes borders. So you have mismatch, search, lower bound, upper bound, equal range, uh, partition point, unique. They all are returning borders. And what about the elements? So they, have, they are, again, like iterators, but there should never be end because, well, there's no element where there is end. And, and you shouldn't be able to increment past the, last, past the last element. You should always point at an element. And, and instead of element before, element after, it has border before, border after. And there are algorithms that return elements. We always used find here, find if, 
Uh, but also max min element also goes into this category. It's, it's returning an element. And you could imagine you have a, a, a utility to turn a range of, of borders, described by borders, into the elements. This is kind of like, give me, if you think iterators, give me the iterators out of that, of that range, one after the other. Um, but really, you should call them elements, because you are describing now the individual elements of the range. Um, the other thing that we should do is make elements nullable. So it's, it's then just very much like a pointer. Um, so that the pointer is, is an element concept. And because it's, it's contextually convertible to bool. Elements are contextually convertible to bool. And that, that null state that, that's reached just through value initialization, just like with pointers. And then functions returning elements, which didn't find anything, they can return null instead of end. And then you can write these kind of things. You can say, OK, if auto it equals tc find, and you see here tc find, that's, that's, that's our function uh, from the library. And it, it actually implements these things. Now, if we're already that far, uh, we can go a step further. We can try to make the programmer um, encode her intent a, a, little, a little more succinctly. So find has that property, yeah, it finds stuff. But very often, you have a pretty clear idea in the code, not only that you want an element, but that you also want to find a one single element. Then there should be in your whole sequence, there should only be one with such property. And we should be able to write that, I think. So we have find unique. Uh, there can also be find first, find last, which doesn't do, a, do these, these, these um, at the end assertions. So all you get with the find unique is an automatic assert that there's nothing else in the sequence which satisfies your criteria. Um, and then there could be trim left, trim right, which for these cases where you actually want borders. You're really trimming your sequence, your original sequence, um, if you want a border. Now, the lower bound is very frequently a binary search. So we, had, we now have binary find in our library, binary find unique, which finds the unique element, binary find first, binary find last, um, and of course, the original lower bound. And of course, that's how we actually did the counts that I um, referred to earlier. We had introduced that in our code base to write expressive code. And so all we needed to do is, is, is basically search through the code base how often everything is being used. Um, now, if, if this all doesn't fit your bill, of course, you can always do border before, border after to convert elements to borders. OK, um, and yes, I said unique functions, they are purely asserts. Mm, now, the idea is um, of, these, of this making the, the element con contextually convertible to bool is that you want to mention this range only once so that you can write the range expression in line. You don't have to put it into a variable. Now, um, well, let's go one step further again and say sometimes you, you need that range again. For example, um, not always. If you, if you need only the border, that's fine, right? So if you have lower bound return border. Um, but maybe sometimes you want actually the range that goes up to that border. Or you want to go from that border to the end of the range. That's, that's quite handy when you program. And, um, and yes, and you can supply these things as template parameters describing what you want. Now, if you don't like template parameters, it could be tags, type, like tag types, or whatever floats your boat. Um, there are more functions, or there are more, there are more of these specifications. There is a return element after, return element before. Um, now, this, the, um, there is the, when, if there is not, no such an element, right? You may have an, an, a range at the very beginning or very end. Um, you can say, OK, I, I, want, I want to allow null, or I don't want to allow null, right? So I, I, don't, I want to be able to say, OK, I'm, I'm going to guarantee that I'll give you an answer. I don't guarantee that, that, there may, that there's an answer. I'm not, I'm not going to assert whether you get an answer or not. Um, so here, that's, that's here when you, um, you, you can say return element. Uh, but you can also say return element or null. And, and that's just an assert again. Um, there, is, there are functions to, do, to return the adjacent border, beginning or end. Um, or you can even say, OK, I want the view that stops right before the element or that goes beyond the element. And you can even then 
furthermore, specify what happens if you don't find such an element. What do you want then? Do you want the whole range? Do you want an empty range? Uh, what do you want? So that's, that's all in the library. Um, the way it's implemented is quite straightforward. Um, here's a take before or empty. So you are, you are getting um, the, 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 the structs or these template parameters. They contain two functions. One is for packing an element. What do you do with the element? And they, they get past the iterator and, and the range, the input range, and they do the take. And then there is, for the singleton case, you have a pack no element that, that just has to do something. Um, and in this case, it, it's asked to return an empty range. So we just use the range in the very beginning of the, of the, um, of the, of the input range. OK, um, I'm coming to an end. Um, the, the iterator is, is modeled after pointers. And it's, it's I think, a low-level machine concept. They just said, OK, we have pointers. Well, we just make iterators like pointers um, and didn't really think about the exact semantics. Um, element and border are much stronger in that way. I think it's already in our head when we deal with iterators. We already kind of think in terms of borders and elements. So we should really write this into our code so it becomes readable. Um, and it is for, needed for correctness, this distinction for, for some range functions. Um, our library implements some of that. So it does make elements nullable. Um, it does these algorithm refinements that I showed you and allows return specification. We are still don't have other things like uh, we don't prevent the border from being dereferenced, um, which we should. And uh, also, there's still this implicit conversion element to border, uh, which we don't prevent. So there's still, there's still work to do. All right, thank you very much. And uh, yes, of course, we are recruiting as everyone else. So, and if there are any questions, go ahead. What if you, what if there is, if you want to differentiate between a null element and the end element? Right. Uh, right. So, so here, there would be no end element. The, the whole concept of an end element is weird because there's no element there. So, well, but if you mean, it, so, so element, so the, the end iterator by itself is useful, but only in the semantics of a border. If you want to describe something that is at the very end of your sequence, if that, that delineates your sequence to the end, that's the end iterator. And, and there, you, it's absolutely useful, it's essential, but then it is, it is a border, it is not an element. Uh, so the, the find would not give you the end iterator back if it doesn't find anything. It would give you a, I didn't find anything back, which I would say is a, a null iterator. And, and could nullable iterators and non-nullable iterators be, be, be differentiated further? Yes, they could be. I mean, there's, there's, it's the old question of how do you represent you know, nullable things? And, and probably now the agreement is you should kind of opt in to, to things to be nullable. Um, we didn't go quite that far. We just said, okay, we, 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 have, we have iterators which are potentially nullable. Um, but yes, we do could, con could even add more type sugar uh, to say, okay, there, these are really two different things.